All right, hello museum families and welcome to RBCM at Home Kids, a play date through screens across British Columbia and the world. The previous sessions are recorded and you can find them on our Royal BC Museum YouTube page. So my name is Chris O'Connor and I'm a learning program developer at the Royal BC Museum. The museum and my home is on the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt nations here in Victoria on Vancouver Island. So we love books here. As a museum, we create books. During our camps and other programs, we're surrounded by books for all ages. And that love of books will be our guide these next two weeks of RBCM at Home Kids. This week we'll be listening to books being read and next week we'll be creating illustrations, pictures for books. And for both weeks, we're working with the Greater Victoria Public Library and their BC Summer Reading Club. So I'm really excited about that. So as we do each week, I'm just going to, going to share the screen. And we're going to go back to what we did last week. So last week, was, it fell on Canada Day. So we had our Penny Carnival, our, our uh, first and maybe probably only virtual <laughs> Penny Carnival. So we created uh, Penny Carnival games and, um, and that was a lot of fun. So we're not making anything today per se, but if you are listening and drawing, we'd love to see your art, your orca art. If you, if you want to do some drawing while you're listening, um, please feel free to share that with me. Um, so that's my email there, C-O-C-O-N-N-O-R at royalbcmuseum.bc.ca. You could also share it through our socials uh, channels, so at Royal BC Museum or hashtag RBCM Kids. Continue exploring after um, the, through our learning portal. It's an online digital resource, lots of really fun ways to learn and things to learn uh, on that. So you can Google Royal BC Museum and learning portal or use that address there. And then, as I mentioned, next week, we're going to be doing book illustration with Ellen Rooney, who's an incredible artist. And she actually worked at the museum for a little bit, too. So um, it would be nice to see her again. Uh, and But she's full time doing illustration now. All right, so I'm going to stop the sharing of my screen. Now we're back. So. Just a reminder, in this format, you can see me, I'm your host, and our special guests. And today we have Mark and Deborah. Though we can't see you, we can hear you um, if you use the Q&A box, if you're on, in the Zoom room, or the comments section if you're on Facebook Live. So please feel free, 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 feel free to ask questions as we go along. And heads up, usually we will ask you to gather materials for making and a making activity, but today there won't be a making, there'll just be a listening. Uh, of orca stories. Uh, but again, you feel free to draw as you're listening. So let's meet our special guests for today. First up, we have Deborah Vanderlyn. Deborah is a public services librarian at the Greater Victoria Public Library with a focus on middle childhood and tween literacy. And you might see her at, a, at the Oak Bay branch. Um, Deborah, can you tell us a little bit about the BC Summer Reading Club and then give us a few recommendations for books we we can check out this or Definitely. explore. So we are doing Summer Reading Club this year. It's just taking on slightly a little bit, a little bit of, of a different form. Um, we are moving virtually. So we're going to have all sorts of weekly activities um, on our website. If you just go to our website, gbpl.ca forward slash SRC. But SRC, it's a reading, a summer reading program where we want everybody, kids age 12 and under and their families to read for about 20 minutes a day. And we have reading logs, we have incentives, and there's all sorts of fun. So now, as for things to read, I would like to um, actually highlight one of our platforms where we have done something special. So, because everything right now is sort of just partially opening up, we do have some limited services at our central branch. And soon, Juan de Fuca, they'll be soon opening up where you can pick up holds and um, even browse a small collection and pick up your reading logs, um, our summer reading club starter kits. However, on our ebook and e-audiobook platform, Cloud Library, we actually have a special summer reading club bookshelf, and it goes with the theme each week. So we, I would 
love if everyone went to check that out. And there's a whole bunch of hand selected books there just for the Summer Reading Club. Can you say that uh, name again? It is our cloud library, um, ebook and e-audiobook platform, and it's accessible through our website. So gvpl.ca. And if you want to look at the Summer Reading Club, and like I said, we're going to have all sorts of fun weekly activities that you can participate in. Again, gvpl.ca forward slash SRC, and we'd love to see people. Great. We just put that in the link. Uh, oh, marvelous. In the Zoom room, and then uh, Wes, our colleague, will do that in, on uh, the Facebook Live feed, too. Marvelous. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. And thanks so much for joining us these two weeks. Oh, thanks for having me. It's so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so our next, um, our guest, our, our, our author for today, um, we have Mark Laren Young. So Mark is a wonderful author of books, a playwright, and a journalist. And for the last few years, he's been working with us here at the Royal BC Museum as a writer for our upcoming exhibition about orcas which will open next May. It was supposed to open this May, uh, but because of everything, we pushed it back a, a year. Um, so more time to get excited about it opening up. It's gonna be a really incredible exhibition, made even more incredible by the words that Mark uh, is putting uh, with it. So Mark, it's so great to have you here. Thank you so much for doing this. It's, it's so happy to be doing this. I'm so happy to be doing this with the museum after spending so much time there lately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we miss you. We miss you being here. It's very exciting. I even recognize the room you're in. It's, yeah. And I remember actually a, a few years ago, before you became part of the project, you were doing an event here with us. You were being celebrated uh, at a book event. And I, I remember saying to you, oh, Mark, you know, we were thinking about doing an orcas exhibition. It'd be great to have you be a part of it. And then through many different channels, you, you were a part of it and you have been a very core part of it, so. Well, um, the funniest thing was when I was at UVic, one of my friends was volunteering at the Royal, Muse at the Royal BC Museum. And we went and wa walked through the exhibits and I said, I wonder who writes those? Wouldn't that be the coolest thing to be the person who writes those? Yeah. So that'd be actually, you know, now to be the person who writes those, that, it's just phenomenal. So it, is it as cool as you thought it would be? It really, it really is. I'm okay. so excited to see those panels. I've never written for panels before. So. so Mark, you're an author and there's lots of kids watching right now. So I'm curious, when was, when did you, when did you start writing or when did you realize that writing was something that you, you wanted to do for your, your career, for your life? I actually started writing, I, I took writing very seriously from the time I was in elementary school. I remember two different things in elementary school and I'm, I'm never sure which is the one that actually started me writing. And one was I wrote a story that made everybody laugh and I got to read it to all the younger grades. I was in like grade six or seven. And I wrote a story that made everybody laugh. And I got to go to all the classes for like the grade twos and threes and read them. And that was amazingly cool. And the other was when I was the, in grade seven. The power seven, of laughter. The power of laughter. But also uh, when I was in grade seven, I, we all had to write horror stories and we read them in the library's quiet room. Um, my horror story actually scared a couple of bullies who had been bothering me, and I thought that was pretty cool too. So the power of words. So I words wanted to be a writer from the time I was in elementary school, and I wrote for high school papers and I wrote plays in high school. And but so yeah, I was, bullies. Exactly, <laughs> it was a horror story, but were tigers. So yeah. Right. yeah. And now um, you've written about lots of different things, but recently you've been writing more about orcas. Um, so I'm curious, what, it, what brought you to that or what, what sort of inspired that passion of, for orcas? Well, you know, you were talking about the book where we had the event at the Royal BC Museum and it was hilarious because for me, because I won the award for best science book in Canada. This is the book, it's called The Killer Whale Who Changed the World. And I, this is the story of Moby Doll, who was the first orca ever captured and displayed in captivity in the world. And this happened, the, Moby was caught by the Vancouver Aquarium, never shown at the Vancouver Aquarium, but caught at the Vancouver, caught by the Vancouver Aquarium. And 
the Vank for Krim had set out to kill a killer whale because they were considered monsters. And they accidentally caught one instead and almost immediately realized, whoa, hold on, not monsters. And once I met the people who were involved in this, I realized I'd stumbled onto a real life science fiction story. This was first contact with an alien. So it wasn't the idea that it was an orca that caught me. And I've been into, I mean, I'd love, I grew up in BC. I grew up in Vancouver. I've loved orcas pretty much my entire life, but I'd never really thought about writing about them. But the idea that once these people met orcas, met this one whale, Moby Doll, we went from wanting to, we went from finding orcas terrifying, fishermen used to shoot at them because they ate our salmon. We had a machine gun put up in Campbell River to take out the dreaded killer whales. And almost overnight, once people met Moby Doll, everything shifted. And I thought, oh wow, I've stumbled onto real life science fiction. I've discovered first contact with an alien species. And I had to tell that story. And so I told that story for adults, although I know a lot of teenagers and even elementary school students have read that book. And that led to Orca Publishing approaching me and saying, have you ever thought about writing for kids? And I've actually written a lot of cartoons. I've written a lot of animation over the years. And I've written for preschoolers. I've written for elementary. And, you know, everything for a show called, called Toy Castle to reboot and Transformers Beast Wars. So the idea of writing for kids was a lot of fun. I was very excited about it. And that led to me writing three different books about whales that have all just come out with Orca Publishing. Nice. And, and I, it makes me think of just um, when you're asked to read for us or write something for a specific audience, how, do you have, how do you, how do you do that? Do you think about do you think about particular kids or do you, or do you interview some kids to find out like, like how do you make that transition from writing for adults to writing for kids? I, whenever I can, I interview kids. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Esquimalt High School when I was working on Orcas Everywhere, which is, uh, this book was in middle school. Ooh, Orcas Everywhere. And I try and ask questions about what people are interested in, but also sort of listen to voice and listen to language people are using. So whenever I'm writing for a different audience, I try and spend time with that audience. And as much as possible, try and test drive the book on that audience. Whenever. So that's the edit. So name. speaking of test drive, I'd love to hear some of, of, one, of your, one of your books. Okay. Uh, since I have Orcas Everywhere out, I'm just gonna read you a little bit from this and then I'm gonna read from Orcas of the Sailor Sea. So I just wanna show, one of the things that is cool about this book is that we have photos of orcas everywhere. So there are a couple of orcas in Norway. And yes, that really is the sunset. Not quite translating over Zoom and Facebook Live, but. So this is, uh, this is from a chapter called Orca Mysteries. Psychic Orcas. When the Vancouver Aquarium was waiting to harpoon an orca, Murray Newman mused that whales must be able to sense trouble. Ted Griffin, the first human to swim with an orca, was certain he had formed a psychic link with Namu. If you ask most people who've spent time around orcas whether orcas are psychic, they probably won't like the word because it suggests something supernatural. But almost everyone Almost every researcher has a story about an orca who did something impossible to explain. When Rain Banu set out to film Granny for our movie about her, Granny put on a show. As soon as Rain arrived with her camera, Granny greeted us with a tail slap, a spy hop, and two breeches. We were with two people who'd been watching whales for over 20 years. They'd seen Granny breach only a half dozen times, ever. But when we arrived, Granny performed like a movie star. Alexandra Morton wrote in her book, The Company of Whales, that the orca she was looking to study showed up to greet her on her first day in Alert Bay, British Columbia. 
She also told me about the day her small boat was lost in the fog and several orcas she knew showed up and led her safely home. Ken Balcom has an almost identical story about being saved by a pod of the orcas he studied. The Haida in northern BC and Alaska say orcas show up for funerals. Indigenous stories used to be dismissed by non-Indigenous people as myths or legends, which makes it tough to explain why orcas keep showing up at Haida funerals. Just before writer Stephen Reed died on Haida Gwaii in 2018, seven orcas appeared in the water nearby. His wife, poet Susan Musgrave, was sure they'd shown up to send him off. When Michael Biggs' ashes were scattered in Johnstone Strait, he was the person who discovered there were two types of orcas, residents and transients, and that led to discovery there were like 13 different types of orcas around the world. 30 orcas arrived to witness the ceremony. Between 2011 and 2018, there have been six gatherings of orca lovers in Friday Harbor on San Juan Island. Each of these conventions is called Superpod, in honor of the whales getting together. San Juan Island is one of the best places in the world to watch orcas, but the southern residents haven't been around much over the last few years. You can certainly never count on them showing up, except for Superpod. When J-Pod arrived on the first day of the 2018 event, people were happy, but not surprised. On the final night, the Superpod people, including me, partied in Lime Kiln Point Park, and members of J-Pod showed up like they had been invited. They have appeared at all six gatherings of the humans devoted to helping them. The night I decided to read part of this book to an audience for the very first time, something impossible happened. I had been invited to talk in the park at East Point on Saturna Island. I was sitting in almost the exact same spot where Joe Bauer and Sam Birch camped years years earlier as they waited to harpoon a whale, the whale in the Moby Doll. A few minutes before my talk, someone shouted, whale, just like Joe Bauer did back when he saw Moby Doll in 1964. But it wasn't just a whale, it was J-Pod, Moby's family. This was the first time I had ever seen them from the shores of Saturna. And they weren't just swimming, they were breaching over and over and over in the same spot where Moby was captured for almost half an hour everyone in the park watched the whales play. A few minutes after the whales swam off, I read the audience this chapter, except for the new paragraph you just heard. In Shakespeare's play Hamlet, the prince tells his pal Horatio, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Orcas continually prove there are more things in the ocean than are dreamt of in our science. Wow, that's really powerful. It's, it's so amazing. I have not met a single orca expert who doesn't have a story that they're almost embarrassed to tell you because the story is impossible. <laughs> and the number of people who've devoted, who had decided to devote their lives to orcas, who saw an orca on their first time on the water, their first time when they moved to BC is impossible. Mm. Like it, it's just, it's impossible. And yet everybody has these stories about orcas doing absolutely impossible things. Mm. It's, it's one of the things that made me go from interested in Moby Doll to interested in all orcas. The more time I spent learning about orcas, the more obsessed I became with how amazing they are, especially the Southern residents. Mm -hmm. So I'll get, so we're like the stars of our, of the, our exhibit. Mark, we have a, a question from Tannis. Yes, writes, hi Tannis. Uh, did, did orca whales be, get called killer, killer whales, killer whales because people were afraid of them? Orcas got called killer whales because some orcas eat other whales. So orcas are the apex predator. They're, they're the top predator in all the oceans. So the, the transients, also known as the big whales in BC, they will eat minke whales. They will eat humpback whales. So basically they got the name killer whale because they are the killer of other whales. So, and one of the cooler stories I came across, which is in the museum exhibit, uh, is a, that in Australia and in Russia and, and possibly in other places, the human hunters would work with the whales, would work with the orcas to hunt other kinds of whales. So in Australia, there were, there were hunters who worked with a team of whales. And the whales would go, hey, humpbacks, go get them. 
And in exchange for corralling the humpbacks, they would get to eat the cheeks and the tongue, which are apparently the yummy part of the humpback if you are an orca who likes eating other whales. So that's where they got the name. That's incredible. So, um, Deborah, did you have any questions or? Um... No, but those are some amazing stories and some amazing information. Uh -huh. <laughs> cool. So Mark, so we're going to go I... to your next, next book. Yeah, I actually thought I'd mention, in case there are any really tiny people watching this, I also I did a book called Big Whale Small World. So this is the board book. And... Oh, that's a magical. It's... There, I've got a... My goddaughter just finished reading the book on, on Facebook and read it out loud. So I think that's my favorite video on Facebook ever, is listening to her read Big Whale Small World. So this book is called Orcas of the Salish Sea. And this features a lot of the orcas who are in our exhibit at the Royal BC Museum. And here's the back cover by my friend Clint Rivers. And yes, that really is an orca blowing heart. So I'll read you just a little bit of this. It starts with a map, like all great adventure books. Mark, Mark just map before you begin, yep. before you begin, we have a question from from Nikki and Henry. Hi, Nikki um, and Henry. Would they would like to know who would win in a fight between a shark and a killer whale? Oh, that's so cool. I talk about that in the book. Uh, orcas, 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 orcas. That the, the shark that's considered the scariest shark in the world is the great white shark. That's, that's the shark that sort of became infamous to humans because of the movie called Jaws and a million sequels. And a couple of orcas in South Africa have decided that the tastiest thing in the entire world is shark liver. So these orcas have discovered how to turn great white sharks upside down, paralyze them and eat them. So sharks and really, really big whales stay out of the way of yeah. orcas. Because <laughs> if orcas think you're tasty, you're in trouble. We're, you know, they do not think humans are tasty or you know, they've, they've never really interested us. Yeah, I just saw that orcas are very smart. Orcas are brilliant. So, and, ju and just let one more question before you begin. So, sure. Debbie asks, how often do orca superpods occur in nature? They are very rare. That was why it was so amazing that we actually got one on, on camera. So we, we've got a movie and you can see it on CBC Gem if you're in Canada called The Hundred Year Old Whale. That was the movie I was talking about. And that's the story of Granny. And it's a short film. It's on CBC Gem. You can also visit my website, orcaseverywhere.com or larenyoung.com, and you can get links to those. But you can actually see Granny, and you can see that sequence where, where she breaches. The craziest thing about that is Rain was filming, and you can actually hear these two people who've been watching whales for 20 something years going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, it's Granny. And they're, they're screaming like little kids, it's so cool. And we had to cut the part where I'm going, please tell me you got the shot. Please tell me you got the shot. Please tell me you got the shot. Because it's so amazing that we actually have that footage in our movie. So, all right, here is Orcas of the Salish Sea. I'll read you just a little bit of this and it's available at all the bookstores in Victoria, and of course, at the Victoria Public Libraries. Yeah. Onyx is one of the world's most famous whales. He lives in the Salish Sea in the Pacific Ocean. Onyx is part of a community called Southern Resident Orcas. They spend most of their time off the coast of Washington and British Columbia. Southern residents are superstars. They have been watched, studied, photographed, and filmed more than any other wild whales in the world. There's a picture of onyx breaching. Okay. Southern residents swim back and forth between the United States and Canada. Whales don't know our borders. I put that in because whales do have their own borders. Whale communities are called pods because whales stick together like peas in pods. When two or more Southern resident pods meet, they line up to say hello. After they greet each other, the pods swim together. We call that a super pod. It is an orca party. There's our guy again. 
When scientists started studying these orcas in the wild, they gave each pod letters so they could tell them apart. There are three southern resident pods, J, K, and L. Scientists also gave each whale a number. Over the years, more than 40 orcas have been counted in K-pod, more than 50 in J-pod, and over 120 in L-pod. But in 2019, there were fewer than 75 southern resident orcas, now 72. The pod we know best is J-pod. J-pod whales always make waves. Southern resident orcas stay with their pods their entire lives. The resident boys always swim at their mom's side. Their mothers help them survive. Male residents don't live long without mom to look after them. Onyx was born in 1992. After his mother Olympia died, Onyx surprised human scientists by leaving L-pod and joining K-pod. Onyx adopted two new mothers, Lummy and Georgia. After they died, Onyx surprised the experts again when he left K-pod and joined J-pod. That's when Onyx met Granny, the oldest whale in the Salish Sea. Scientists named her Granny because they knew she was a grandmother. In orca societies, mothers lead the families. The eldest females lead the pods. Communities led by females are called matriarchies. When Onyx started swimming with her, Granny was the matriarch of J-Pod and all the Southern residents. Granny starred in books and movies. She was loved by many people in Washington State. She was elected honorary mayor of Orcas Island. There's a street named after on San Juan Island. Some people think she was over 100 years old when she died. After Granny died, Onyx stayed with J-Pod. And here is Granny breaching. This was her the night I was talking about. And I'm guessing I've got to wind down for more questions now. Or can I read one more page? Can I get one more page in? Yeah, definitely. You could do one more page. Orcas communicate using sounds we call vocalizations. We don't know if orcas have words like we do, but we know they understand each other. Each pod has its own unique vocalizations. Orcas also have a superpower called echolocation. They send out sound waves that bounce off everything nearby. These waves show orcas the world around them. Echolocations. Echolocation is whale sonar. Sometimes orcas like Onyx see the world by poking their heads above the water to watch what's going on. It looks like they are balancing on their tails. We call this spy hopping. We don't know what they call it. And here, I got some spy hopping. Kind of looks like stargazing too. It really does. <laughs> it really is amazing. Um, thank you so much, Mark, for for reading that. And um, so we uh, we have a couple of well, here's one. So a question from Tanis again. So how hey, how Dennis. do they tell which orca is which? So you were saying the um, you knew that it was J Pod. How 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 do people know uh, which, which whales that they're seeing? Okay, each pod has their own distinct, scientists either call it a dialect or some also call it language, but each pod sounds completely distinct. And so you can tell the pods apart by the way they communicate, but also different, different species basically of, of orcas, the residents and the big orcas, they look different. So you can look and go, the, the dorsals are sharper, the, the builds are different, because they haven't bred in the wild in, in hundreds of thousands of years. But also, each orca has a unique set of markings on their back that we call a saddle patch. It's basically the same as a fingerprint, except much, much, much bigger. So if you look at the saddle patch, you can see that the orcas are different. And every scratch and nick that an orca gets in their life stays with them. So with Granny, there was a little notch on the back of her dorsal. And so you could no tell it was Granny by the notch. You could also tell by the saddle patch, but the notch was the giveaway because you could see that from further away. Uh, so yeah, especially if you're on the shore, uh, you could probably see that better than the, yeah. uh, the markings. Yeah. Um, I was, oh, so how close do orcas get to the shore? The, it depends on where the shoreline is and how deep it is. So 
the closest any orcas get to the shore, there are orcas in Argentina that hunt on the shore. There are actually orcas that hunt on land. And these orcas in Argentina, I talk about them in orcas everywhere, decided that the seals, the seal pups looked really tasty on those beaches. And so they came up with a trick where they will launch themselves onto a beach, roll down and catch the seal pup. And they do similar things in the Arctic where they will actually go out and kind of, they splash seals and sea lions off the ice floes. The closest they get to shore anywhere in British Columbia is on Saturna Island, is Saturna Island East Point. And there's this huge drop off between the shore and the water. And you can almost touch them because they're in the water and it's incredibly deep there, but the water's edge is basically next to this deep drop off of water. So that's why when people went out to hunt an orca and caught Moby Doll, they went to East Point on Saturn Island. Limekiln Park is the same thing, where there's this huge drop off, but they are right next to that shoreline on Saturn Island. It's the best place in Canada and one of the best places in the world to watch orcas from the land, to watch, to do land-based whale watching. Luckily the hunting doesn't happen anymore. It does not happen, nope. I was noticing, so we just have a, say, let's say two minutes. Sure. <laughs> and I was noticing that um, for some of the pictures that they were breaching out of the water and the, most of their body was out of the water. Um, oh, just... they can launch, they launched themselves completely out of the water. No, that, that was the start of the breach. Granny flew out of the water. Oh, yeah. Which is just amazing. Um, my favorite photo of an orca is uh, Scarlet. I don't know if I can grab that fast enough. We only have a minute if I'm keeping this fast. But this amazing baby whale who is just terrific at breaching. And she is in here. I'm just going to flip over talking. Do you think they're trying to impress, you, impress each other with how, <laughs> how much well, they can? That's nah, my favorite photo of an oh, wow. ever. And that's Scarlet and she's featured in the exhibit. Uh -huh. And so they can launch completely out of the water. Yeah. We don't know if they do it for fun. Uh, every sound, we, every sound seems to be about communicating. And the tail slaps, like certainly sometimes the tail slaps seem to be the matriarch going, hey, yeah, everybody come in, or indications of food. But again, when you're getting into different types of orcas, the resident orcas are very chatty. So you can tell the difference between resident orcas and, and transient orcas. So the resident orcas, southern residents, pretty much only eat salmon, especially Chinook salmon. That's their big thing. Well, salmon aren't paying much attention to orca sounds. But seals and sea lions, which are what the bigs, the transient orcas eat, and other whales, they, you need to sneak up on them. So the mammal-eating whales are very quiet. So the cultures are completely different. Mm. So man-bleeding orcas are quiet and stealthy hunters. And they got the name wolves of the sea because the way they hunt, but also because like wolves, they'll pick off a member of a pack. That's how they're able to eat humpback whales or minke whales or other types of whales. Mm. And other types of whales are very cautious when orcas approach because you never know when they're gonna go, oh, you look tasty. Yeah. <laughs> right. But other, but fish and mammals, anything in the ocean can look and go, oh yeah, that's not a mammal eating orca. So sea lions aren't, aren't looking at onyx and going, oh, you're trouble. Because onyx doesn't eat sea lions, onyx eats salmon. Right. And they're, they're very distinct. Um, just before we end, Deborah, is there anything... Any... Would. I'd like to just mention that the books uh, that Mark was just reading from and others by him are all available in our collection, both our physical collection as well as our ebook collection and e audiobook collection. So be sure to check them out. <laughs> and everything's an audiobook almost. Orc is everywhere. I'm recording the audiobook now. Oh, Very nice. nice. Aiming to have it out uh, by the end of the summer. Great. Very exciting. Um, well, Deborah, thank you so much for joining us today and we'll see you next week. And Mark, thank you, Deborah. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you so much, Mark, for joining uh, us today. And um, orcas are endlessly fascinating. Uh, so thank you for piquing our curios curiosity and interest even more. So.
Thank you. May I just mention? Uh, may I just mention one quick thing? Oh please, yeah. Uh, I became so obsessed with these orchids because of all the work I was doing. Also, all of the scientists around the world kept calling me and going, I've got another cool story. I'm like, the book's finished. I've got nowhere for your cool story. That uh, three years ago, I launched a podcast called Scanna. I wanted to call it podcast, but then nobody would be able to find it. Right. <laughs> and so Scanna's on iTunes and everywhere you find podcasts. And it's, it, it features interviews with orca experts, oceans experts, people fighting to protect the oceans. And so if you want more in-depth interviews with people, you can check that out at Scanna. And again, orcaseverywhere.com or larryneyoung.com, you can find the books and extra stories. And like, I have a list of all the names of different orcas around the world and stuff like that. Great. And Liz just put it in the chat uh, on, on, uh, in Zoom. So. And Fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. So thanks, everyone. And we'll, we'll say goodbye now. And we'll see you next week. And Bye, thank Marty. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>